Welcome back. Before we wrap up our meeting, let's talk about what to do if our asphyxiant hazard controls fail. You're familiar with the worksite's emergency response plan, right? Yes. You remind us to review it all the time. That's right. We all need to be familiar with the ERP. It describes the specific emergency procedures, responsibilities, contacts, and important locations you need to know if an incident occurs on site. Isn't there also a first aid plan for each site? Yes. It's another key source of emergency information, detailing the site's first aid procedures, equipment and facilities, and where to find them. If there's an incident, there's no time to look that stuff up. Exactly. The same goes for this seven-step emergency response strategy. It's only useful if we know it well enough to be an automatic response if there's an incident. I see that poster every day during lunch, but I wonder if I could recall those steps during an emergency. Let's work through a hypothetical incident response to see what we know. Suppose nitrogen had been added to a tank so we could safely remove the iron sulfide residue during cleaning. Sam, can we use you as the person who needs rescuing in this scenario? Of course. Let's do it. Imagine that your crew has completed the cleaning of the tank and nitrogen is no longer being added to the tank. Stephen was monitoring the space, and he and Renee are discussing the work when you realize you forgot your tool bag. Without thinking, you lean forward into the tank to grab the bag. I know that's a big mistake with a tank that still contains some nitrogen, but it does seem tempting to just reach inside and grab the bag. You're right, Sam. Just reaching inside the tank entrance seems harmless, but this tank was inerted with nitrogen. Remember, Cold nitrogen is denser than the ambient air, so it will start to settle near the bottom of the tank. Right. So when I reach in, I break the plane of the confined space and risk exposing myself to the nitrogen atmosphere. Exactly. And you're also reaching toward the floor, where the dense cold nitrogen gas naturally accumulates. No wonder I passed out. You guys better rescue me fast. Emergency. 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 Okay, you've initiated the emergency procedure by evacuating and calling for help. What happens now? We assess the situation. She's so close, I can't just leave her. I could just reach in and grab her. It's too dangerous. We know the tank contains nitrogen, and she's in a position that requires a trained rescuer to enter the space. I've called the emergency response team. We have moved to a safe area, and I'll stand by to direct the responders. Based on our plan, the rescue team was nearby and arrived fast. Yeah, they have the training and equipment to safely rescue someone from a confined space. Assessing someone who's been exposed to an asphyxiant requires training. Medical professionals will monitor for symptoms such as dizziness, nausea, confusion, or continued respiratory distress, even after removal from the hazardous environment. Some complex gases like H2S or carbon monoxide interfere with the body's ability to use oxygen and can have delayed effects. Trained responders will monitor vital signs and administer life-saving treatments. Your part in this was knowing the emergency protocol. Stephen knew the radio channel and message to use to get help fast. And you both assessed the situation correctly. Attempting to reach Sam yourselves was too dangerous. Asphyxiant incidents can be sudden and devastating, but with the right knowledge and swift action, we can save lives. Here's how you can help. Understand how simple and chemical asphyxiants affect the body. Know how to identify them and where they're used. Know how to assess and control asphyxiant hazards. And remember these important steps so you're prepared to respond in case of an emergency that involves asphyxiant hazards. Your actions matter. Visit Energy Safety Canada to learn more about what it takes to safely complete work.